I do find something curiously appealing about small form factor GPUs, especially when they have gaming performance that betrays their unassuming exterior. Of course, performance is relative, none of the single slot, low TDP cards I've accrued recently has the kind of power to run the latest AAA games without making serious compromises, but put them to the test in esports, indie and older titles, and you might find they have a surprising amount of power. Valorant is one of the easiest games to run that people actually want to play. At the beginning of this channel I actually included it in my main graphics card test suite until I realised everything from an R9 270X on up was being limited to about 180 FPS by my quad-core Ryzen CPU. In this video I'm going to test out some cards that will find the game more challenging. The trio of display adapters in question are reasonably varied but share three things in common. They're all Nvidia, because I'm obviously a fanboy and or paid shill. They're all single slot designs and they're all bus powered, meaning they don't need schmancy power supplies to work. Aside from that, they're each unique in their own ways. First, my personal favourite, the underrated Quadro K1200. Although the letter in Quadro card names usually indicates the architecture, the K1200 is actually a Maxwell One card meaning it's still supported by Nvidia's most recent drivers. As it's a Quadro, this means studio drivers, but that shouldn't affect the card's ability to play games. Drivers aside, the K1200 is a 4GB workstation variant of the GTX 750. Last year I established that it can, in fact, game, and I'll be revisiting it later this year to see how far it can get through my 2022 test suite before it gives up and cries for its mom. I purchased mine on eBay last year for £55. Next, another low profile Quadro in the form of the P400. On paper it looks like an interesting card, with Pascal architecture, DX12 and Vulkan compatibility, and 2 gigs of GDDR5, but don't be fooled, this card has the same number of CUDA cores as the Vaporware GT1010, the lost successor to the GT710 and sickly younger brother of the GT1030. While not the worst card in the world, it is about the worst performing discrete desktop GPU that can still play the majority of modern games, and is probably not worth the £60 I paid. If you need further proof of that, there's a full review linked in the doobly-doo. Finally, I've already mentioned its name once, and if I say it four more times, a guy with a hook for a hand will appear to disembowel me, it's the GeForce GT710. There are a number of variants of this cursed card in the wild, varying from old Fermi-based models to still old Kepler versions. The one I have here is a passively cooled Kepler model from EVGA with 1GB of DDR3, purchased a year ago for £14. While I fully expect this to be the worst card of the three, it has an ace up its sleeve. As a GeForce, it's the only card I'm testing today capable of being clocked above its rated speeds without hardcore BIOS modding. I've established that my card can run at some pretty astonishing overclocks, some 375MHz above stock speeds, and that can have a massive boost to performance. So I'll be testing this card in both stock and OC configurations. Before I get started, I'm testing on my standard test rig, the MPGPC, with an overclocked 6-core Ryzen 5 5600G and 16 gigs of DDR4 3600. Valorant is pretty easy to bottleneck with a sufficiently slow CPU, though it's more than enough for the cards featured today. Although this video isn't really intended to be a consumer guide, and it's just me having a bit of fun, you should bear in mind that slower CPUs will make it harder to hit those higher frame rates regardless of the GPU. Let's get this one out of the way first. Y you know, the Kepler one. At stock clocks, the GT710, damn it, hasn't improved since I last looked at it in 2021. At 1080 high, running around an empty arena, I saw an average of just 26.5 FPS and 1% lows of 21. Of course, you'd be mad to play these settings with this card. Dropping to medium isn't really enough to help either, seeing an uplift of 5 FPS to get us barely above the 30 mark. At low settings, averages hit 34 and lows seldom drop below 30. 
I wouldn't urge anyone to accept that kind of performance as good enough, however. Dropping the render resolution to 1280x720 isn't too impactful on image quality or visibility, but sees a big jump in frame rates. High settings now pushes 50fps on average and 40fps lows. Dropping to medium is getting closer to the magic 60, but it's 720 low that proves to be the sweet spot here. Averages jump to 68 FPS, with lows just a couple of frames below 60. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, even my humble passively cooled card, which runs at about 50 degrees at stock speeds, is good for a 375 MHz boost to both core and memory speeds. Of course, this doesn't suddenly turn the GT710 for f**k's sake into a gaming beast, however it does gain a massive 10 FPS across the board at 1080. This means 1080 low, averaging 45 FPS and not dropping much below 40, has gone from being borderline unplayable to surprisingly palatable. 1280x720 sees even bigger gains, close to or even exceeding 20 FPS. At high settings, the GPU that can't be named makes an eminently playable experience, managing to hit an average of 66.6 FPS. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Medium climbs to 76, and lows manage a frankly astonishing 90 FPS on average. Now, you'll note I said that I did my tests in an empty arena. This is for consistency, but you might well wonder how this translates to actual gameplay. Well, I chose to benchmark a live deathmatch at 1080 low to see how it compares, as well as provide something more interesting for you guys to watch, and it was pretty consistent with what I saw in the testing phase. Weirdly, I think this might have been my best match of the day too. Moving up to the first of the Quadros, the P400. In my review of this card, I called it the worst modern GPU, as unlike the previous card, it is currently receiving updated drivers and runs DX12 games. As Valorant appears to run in DX11, that distinction is meaningless here, and the P400 runs rings around the old Kepler card. Although the P400 cannot be overclocked, at least not using any methods I'm willing to try out, it more than doubles the performance of the overclocked GT you know what. This means 1080 high averages almost 70 FPS, with 1% lows close to 60. Dropping settings to medium is enough to maintain a constant 60, with averages just short of 80 FPS and lows of 67. Dropping to low isn't really necessary at this point, but doing so sees the average reach just over 90 FPS. Taking advantage of the higher refresh rates of my monitor, however, requires dropping the resolution. 1280x720 at high settings is already getting close to the mark, averaging 128 FPS and with 1% lows just above 100. Medium sees averages just passing over my monitor's refresh rate, and low does the same for the 1% value. Now, even though 1440-144Hz displays have come down in price, they still cost more than double what this GPU did, so it's still a fairly nonsensical comparison, but I'm not about to pretend this is a buyer's guide. Once more, in grabbing some more entertaining footage to run over this video, I tested at 1080 low in live deathmatch gameplay, this time on a different map than usual, and saw 10% lower averages and over 20% lower minimums, though still well within the realms of what I'd consider playable. Finally then, the Quadro K1200, and while this isn't the same kind of performance leap the P400 saw over the GT thingy-bob, it still justifies my faith in the older Maxwell card. At 1080 high, averages are already over 100 FPS, with 1% lows of 85. Medium takes averages to above 120 FPS, and 1% lows almost hit 100. Finally, for the true high refresh experience, 1080 low manages to average 136 FPS and doesn't drop much below 114. It does seem sort of unnecessary to drop resolution any further than this, but I wasn't going to leave things unfinished and I wanted to see how far the CPU could take things. As it turned out, the 5600G is no bottleneck at all here on the K1200. At 1280x720 high, 1% lows past the 144Hz refresh point, and averages are on the cusp of 200 FPS. 
Dropping settings to medium sees that average climb to 222 and 1% lows are now over 170 FPS. Finally, with settings down all the way to low, the average FPS passes the refresh rate of even some higher end monitors, hitting 250 and not dropping below 200 very often. For the final time, I took the K1200 out for a spin at 1080 low in a real game, and FPS lined up once more very nicely with the scores from the initial testing. Hopefully you found that entertaining. I know it wasn't my usual style of video. I'm not particularly recommending these cards for esports gaming, and given the prices you'd either need to find a spectacularly good deal or have one literally fall into your lap to recommend them over most of the other cards available for between 60 and 80 pounds. On the other hand, I suppose there's an outside chance someone found this useful, in which case I'll sign off with a recommendation to watch one of my other videos on these cards, and to once more, please never even think about buying a GT710. Oh shit.